Welcome to the Lightworkers Lab, a podcast for spiritual people who want to go deeper, aim higher, and design truly extraordinary lives. And now for your host, intuitive coach and spiritual teacher, Crystal Ann Compton. Hey everybody, it's Crystal Ann Compton. How are you guys doing today? I am doing wonderfully. I am in my walk-in closet, which look, I'm beginning to really love. I've got plans and designs now, and I'm thinking, well, if I could move this around and maybe I could put a crystal grid over here, this could really work for me. It's the quietest space in my house, and that's where I am sitting right now talking to you. And I also want to tell you that I've had a really cool week. You know, irrespective of what you may think of me after seeing me on YouTube or being in one of my classes or hearing me talk, etc., I, of course, go through ebbs and flows and I scale mountains and then I dip into valleys. And it seems to be that after maybe two or three months of whirlwind activity where I'm getting a class together or I'm, or I'm sourcing my content or working with students and clients at this all-time high, that there always is an inevitable two-week dip that follows, where I'm essentially just in my bed wondering, what's it all about, Alfie? (laughs) Like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? I often take my own inventory. I often take my own measure and wonder, am I doing the right thing and in the right ways? And as it turns out, my husband was in New York City working, and we were on the phone, and I was feeling that. I was feeling that dip in my energy. I now know it was because I was getting sick, but... I was really kind of feeling sorry for myself. And I articulated to my husband, hey, you know, am I doing the right thing? Like, is this what I'm, am I going in the right, like all that stuff. I just laid it on him. And he, of course, said, absolutely. And I said, well, you know, it would just be nice, wouldn't it, if spirit gave me a sign. (laughs) I can't believe after all these years, and I'm 48 years old, so I'm not a spring chicken, and I've been spiritual my entire life. I've seen evidences from spirit all over the place all of the days of my life, and yet I still say something like that, like, well, wouldn't it be nice if spirit showed up? I'm getting all sorry for myself, and my husband kind of, you know, he knows he has to tread lightly, because if he laughs at me at that moment, then I'm going to go like, what are you laughing? What? And then it turns into a totally different thing. So he didn't. He just said, well, if you need that, then look for that, because that's what spirit will give you. And while we were on the phone, having that conversation there was somebody out there who made the decision and who wrote me and told me that they wanted to offer five scholarships to my listeners, my viewers, and members of the Lightworkers Lab. Now keep in mind, just a couple of days previous to that, someone else had offered five scholarships to five students who'd want to take one of my classes. And now somebody else was stepping up to do it as well. And I was so touched. I'm not going to lie. I had tear balls. I was misting up and I felt a little bit guilty because I had asked spirit, hey, show me something. And of course, spirit did what my husband said spirit did. But there are people out there who want other people to benefit from what we're talking about in the Lightworkers Lab and what we're talking about in these podcasts. Other people were giving me personally their vote of confidence and I'm so grateful I'm grateful because the amount of scholarships went from five to 10. And if you're out there and you want to take one of my classes, whether that's Everything Psychic, The Blueprint, All About Angels, or Supercharge Your Life with Symbols, if you're out there, then I encourage you to write me at scholarships, plural, at crystallandcompton.com. That's scholarships at crystallandcompton.com. Let me know who you are. Let me know what class you want to take and why you think you're a match for these scholarships. There's a potential here that there will be additional scholarships in the future. So if you don't get it now, you may get it in the future. So please do write. One more thing before we get right into the questions is if you have a question, spiritual, metaphysical, personal, I encourage you to send your question in to me at TuesdayQuestions at CrystalAnnCompton.com. That's TuesdayQuestions at CrystalAnnCompton.com. Please make sure to include your date of birth, and if you can, a recent picture of yourself. None of that is shared. It is only provided so that I can hook into your energy. But I encourage you to write and be a partner and be a part 
of this podcast, which I don't know about you, but I'm really, really grateful for and I'm really loving. So without any further ado, and with a really thankful heart this week to Spirit and to you guys, let's get right in to our first question. This question comes from Jeannie S. in Carlsbad, California. And she asks, I've been feeling a presence putting pressure on my back. Who is it and what are they trying to communicate to me? Also, he, she, it is here with me now. Jeannie, as I check in with your energy, first of all, it feels quite good. And it does feel like there are some activations that are taking place in your life. What I sense is that your kundalini is animated. Your kundalini is activated. And what kundalini is is the energy of enlightenment. And it's said to originate at the base of the spine. And as your enlightenment grows, slowly the kundalini progresses up the spine into the head and then out through the crown. As the kundalini energy moves within the body, we do feel the sensations of it. In fact, if we arouse the kundalini incorrectly, We can feel all kinds of different sensations sporadically, and this can actually be uncomfortable and sometimes debilitating, and also it's really confusing to people who don't know what's happening. In your situation, this feels like a really healthy flow, and so I would assume, just by feeling it here on my end, that you're in the process of your own spiritual seeking. And it feels to me like you are on the cusp of hitting a higher enlightenment level or spiritual development level, like you're going to have access to new resources, perhaps something like a mentor or a class, but you are on the cusp of taking in new energy and new information. And the spiritual enlightenment energy within you is responding to your own advancement and in fact is spurring on your advancement. Now, it's not just the kundalini, however. As I look at you from here, and what I'm doing is I'm looking at your total grid, which contains all the other stuff within it, I can actually see a being standing behind you, running his hand up and down your spine, but he's also going lower to towards the legs, back of the thighs, and the feet. Basically, this being seems to be working on your energy generally. This being is a spirit, and when I say spirit, I do not mean that this being is a ghost or an earthbound spirit. We're talking about an emissary here, and what an emissary is, is a representative of the light or a representative of God. And so these are our angels, our guides, our friends in spirit, our gatekeepers, our ancestors, etc. And as I tune into this being, he appears to me to be a guide. And this is someone here with you now at this time in your life as you shift and change and move in the direction of potentially new work for yourself or new understanding. You know what I was just mentioning a little while ago, that it feels like you're on the cusp of this breakthrough to a new level of spiritual development. This being is specifically assisting you with that. Now, I'm not sure what exactly this is going to be. I can say that it doesn't feel like conventional work. In other words, I don't think you're going to get a new job and this being is helping you to do that. This is all about the spirit. This is all about your own consciousness expansion. This is a good thing, and I sense that you already know that. You don't seem afraid in your email, and you don't seem afraid in your energy. And if I were you, what I would do is attempt to partner with this process. Attempt to partner with the activation and the animation of your kundalini or your enlightenment energy. To partner with the process, what you should do is articulate that you'd like to do that. This means to pray or to speak out or to address this being who is high level, high vibration, so of the light, and let them know that you're interested in complementing this work. You're interested in doing the things necessary in your own life to contribute to your spiritual advancement. Ask spirit to provide you with the resources necessary, whether this is knowledge or mentorship or friendship or perhaps new lifestyle choices. Ask spirit to bring this into your awareness so that you can make the modifications necessary. Because if you are willing to hit this next level. And in fact, if you are ready to do so, then spirit has all the tools that you need. And this being is there to assist you in this. 
In conclusion, I just want to say that as I tapped into your energy, uh, your energy is actually really lovely. It's quite high vibration and it seems that you're conscious and aware of energy and how to work with it and spirit. And this is a really, really good thing. So I am excited for you. This question comes from Sarah from Los Angeles, California. And she asks, were all human souls created at the same time? From what I understand, angels and some other beings were created first, and then the human souls. Were we all created at once, or does Source roll us out as needed to fill bodies, etc.? Are the souls of aliens or interdimensional beings any different than ours, and were they created at a different time? This is a really good question, and this actually speaks to a larger vision that I had through my guides and also through some of the angelic emissaries that I work with, and it really blew my mind because they showed me how creation was, as you say, rolled out. And let me just explain to you what it is that they told me. They said that in the beginning was the singularity, was the energy, and was the force. This is the force that we would call God or source energy or creator energy. Please remember, God does not need you to call God anything in particular. God is. From this space of the singularity, God sought to experience itself and brought in the first phase of creation. Within the first phase of creation, only one type of being was created, and these are the archangels. These are literally the sons and the daughters of God. They are the universal or cosmic beings that are closest or most proximate to God and who also share God's spiritual DNA. Some of you listeners out there have children and you know that your son or your daughter shares your DNA. And when your son or daughter has a child in the future, that child will also share your DNA, but not as much DNA as your own son and daughter. So that's what the archangels are. Again, the sons and daughters of source energy. After the first creation phase, the archangels partnered with source energy. We can call this blending with source energy or working with source energy, but essentially they partnered with source energy to bring about the next phase of creation, which we can call phase two. Within phase two of creation, we find the subclasses of angels. These are the angels that work directly with the archangels and which govern specific energies and do specific tasks. In addition, however, the I am's were created in the second phase of creation. What is an I am? Well, you are an I am. Each and every one of us has a higher self. We have an omniscient or oversoul type being out of which we were dispatched into this life. The I am is the whole of who you are. It is your total and complete soul. We've spoken before about iterations and aspects and how the oversoul or the I am sends itself in different fragments into various lives to have experiences. And then it uses those experiences to edify itself and gain proximity back to source. It is the compulsion and desire of all of creation to return to source. That is why we are in this life, and that is why we are in many other lives right at this moment, simultaneously. I want you to think for a second about the vantage point of your I am, or the vantage point of your higher self. Your higher self exists very closely or nearby source energy, draws upon source energy, shares the DNA, the direct DNA of source energy, and also the archangelic. From our point of view as mere humans in this 3D dimension, the Oversoul could also be called a type of God. The Oversoul is omnipresent, meaning it's everywhere. The Oversoul is also omnipotent and omniscient and can see the life that you're living here in this incarnation. This is why it is so important to open up a channel from yourself all the way up to your higher self. This type of channel is facilitated through the spirit, and we were all born with a spirit. We all have the birthright 
to access our higher self and also to access source energy. Now, some of us are out of connection with this and we don't realize this and we don't use that channel. However, if we train ourselves, if we open our perception and if we lean toward our I am and God energy, we are able then to source from it. And what do I mean by source from it? We can pull the knowledge of the higher self into this life. We can pull that higher vantage point of the higher self into this life. The higher self has your blueprint. The higher self knows why it is that you came here. The higher self knows what it is you're supposed to achieve. And so we have this channel straight up to the second phase of creation and beyond through the archangelic into source energy. I deviated a little here on the second phase of creation because I do think it's so important to understand and to perhaps visualize how close your oversoul, your higher self, is to source energy. Now, upon the creation of this second phase, all the beings within the second phase and the archangelic within the first phase partner together with source energy once again to bring out another phase of creation. Within this phase, we have very high level beings. We're not even talking 4D, 5D, 6D. We're talking this, we don't, we, it does not compute. We can't even approach the understanding of that from this vantage point here on earth. We have masters there. We have some interdimensionals there. We have some shining ones there. We have others that are also subclasses of angels. And then all three phases of creation partnered once again with Source to bring about the fourth phase of creation and so on and so forth until you here now came into being in your specific phase of creation. And I think these are infinite phases. And I do think God rolls them out and that it's happening continuously. And that our phase of creation is also partnering with Source Energy to bring about other creation phases. I'm actually working on a book right now called The Word. And it talks about how God created and how we can use the formula that God used to bring about phases of creation or manifestation in our own lives. I refer often back to Jesus saying, you are all gods. And what Jesus is referring to here, well, is an Old Testament scripture, but what he's really saying here is that you can create too. You are made in God's image and you have similar power, especially if we're accessing and running higher self energy. We are all gods. And so at the time that I write and finish this book, I hope to be able to explain a little more deeply how it is that creation happened according to the angelic and the guides that I personally work with. So I will announce that when that comes out, of course, and hopefully that'll give you even more understanding on how everything works. This next question is from Molly M. from Mumbai, India. And she says, I have a question regarding life purpose. How do I figure out my life purpose? How is it different from soul purpose? And I'll start with the second thing that you asked, which, which is essentially what is the difference between the soul purpose and the life purpose? The soul purpose is fairly static. In other words, it is the purpose of the higher self to experience itself in different incarnations and phases so as to assimilate the energy of those lessons and those lives and edify itself. So the soul purpose is to do that. The life purpose speaks to what it is you came into this incarnation to do, why you were born into this life, and what you are supposed to do in terms of acquiring a skill set, understanding which road to take, understanding who your support system is, etc. Now, the life purpose is connected to kind of a very sophisticated blueprint or plan. And this plan involves absolutely everything that you're supposed to do in this life. Before you ever got here, you drew up this blueprint and you drew up this plan with the help of your soul group, with the help of your spirit guides and angels, etc., etc. But you put a lot of things in place and you had a lot of goals for yourself that you wanted to hit. You wanted to learn lesson A, so that you could integrate the energy of lesson A and then send it up to the higher self for the higher self to integrate that lesson into itself. 
Now I should say that most of us, by the time we move on from this life into the next life, have not ticked all the boxes. We're probably not going to do all the things that we said we were going to do or hit all those experiences and lessons that we wanted to hit for ourselves. Detours are so easy in this life. It's simple to lose your way and to feel out of connection. And this creates more possibilities. This creates more pathways that we can walk down, which lead, of course, to additional life experiences, all of which are valuable, all of which are sent up back to the higher self in order to edify the higher self. What you're asking here is not about the blueprint, it doesn't feel like. It's about what you're supposed to be doing in terms of action with your life. What kind of work are you supposed to be doing? And this is a really common question. This is a really popular question. And a lot of people think that a life purpose should be grandiose and impacting many, many people. But that's not necessarily the case. In fact, for the most part, it isn't the case. Most of us didn't come here to have a huge, bombastic, on-blast life. Do you know, Molly, that some of us just came here into this incarnation to say one important thing to one other person? If some of us rolled out the blueprint of our lives and took a look at everything we'd set up for ourselves, we'd see that our purpose comes down to a moment. This is why it is so important to remain present and aware and always looking around for the opportunities to be a blessing or to be of service. This doesn't mean necessarily that your life's work will be your service. It does mean, however, that you can always serve no matter what your life's work. You can always serve no matter what relationship you're involved in. You can always serve and bless no matter what family you were born into. So I'd like you to take the perspective off of this idea that it has to be one thing and instead look at it like it's something that you need to be. This is something you need to occupy. And when you're of the frequency of the highest version of your life in this life, and what I mean by that is, when you are running high vibration and you are in alignment with source energy, which means you're in alignment with the higher self, when you're vibrating at that frequency, you automatically live your life purpose. You automatically draw to yourself that which you are supposed to do and experience and know and assimilate and distribute, etc. You automatically draw these things to you because your frequency is correct. Christ the Avatar said, seek first the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And all these things are going to be added unto you. To put that into your situation, seek first your vibration. Be mindful of your frequency. Be mindful of how saturated you are with love and light. Be mindful of your contribution in this world. The people that you talk to, how do you leave them? Do you leave them better than you found them? The work that you do, how do you leave that? Do you leave it better than you found it? That's the bigger picture of the life purpose. Now, having said that, I do want to say that a lot of people are looking for their work. They're discontented. They're unfulfilled in the present career or present work that they're doing. In this situation, I would say to you, to quote Joseph Campbell, who I adore, follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. What does that mean? To follow your bliss means to look for the energy. Look into all aspects of the life and determine for yourself what truly excites you, what gets your spirit singing in the body. I call this zing zing, and we've all felt it. We've all engaged in certain activities or we've all gotten into certain zones and we could feel that vibration within our body. That's a frequency. Look for the areas in your life where you can feel that vibration. You can feel that energy. That's bliss. Once you've identified it, follow it. Lean all the way into it. Build time into your life for it. Because exciting energy is like a breadcrumb or a series of breadcrumbs. It's a way that spirit leads you down your path. And as you do your own life examination, and identify areas where you have this excited energy or this blissed out energy, you may find that it doesn't make much sense. Maybe for you, you get a lot of excitement out of gardening. 
That doesn't seem like it would be your life purpose, does it? But it could be. Maybe you feel that burst of energy when you're writing or when you're journaling or when you're dancing or when you're singing. And maybe this doesn't feel like it could ever be a career, but it definitely feels spiritual, doesn't it? Don't worry about what it's supposed to look like when you finally identify what the work is or the career is. Just concern yourself with dancing more and gardening more and writing more, or whatever it is that brings you joy, do that, and spirit brings to you, as if you were a magnet, all the things that you need to take the next step. Trust the process. This is called God magnetism, when we're focusing on our spirit first and drawing to us miraculously all of the things that we need, all the doors open effortlessly. We network with the right people. We come upon the right resources. We get the funding for the things that we need to do. We receive creative inspiration. And it's always because we follow the energy. Does that make sense? Are you listening to what I'm saying? Search your heart, Molly, because it's there. We all have a blueprint. We've all come here to do something, but never discount the value of a moment and how you can show up in somebody's life and change that life simply by smiling, simply by saying a kind word. The world needs that more than ever, and that's the purpose for all of our lives. This question comes from Pinky G. Hey, I like that name, Pinky. You actually asked five questions, and I'm not going to be able to answer all of these, but I'm going to go over two or three. The first question you asked is, when I was young, I was super sure a UFO landed in my garden. Did it? And why was I the only one who saw it? The answer to your question is the one that only you can answer, but... As I tap into your grid, your field, I can see lots of cool interdimensional energy here. And I would say that you probably did have that experience. I believe that did happen. And you should know that it is very common in terms of UFO experiencers that not everybody sees the craft or not everyone sees the being. And that's because they're interdimensional. They're entering into your energy to make themselves known to you. Now, sometimes, for example, with the Phoenix Lights, everybody saw that craft, and that is exactly what they wanted. But often they will appear to just one person to signal them, to let them know that they are present, and then they will pop out of their dimension or out of their energy entirely. You may say to yourself, well, Aren't I in the same dimension <laughs> as everybody else? And yes, of course you are. But let me tell you something. You have a grid. Your grid is this huge, usually spherical, energetic field that contains absolutely every part of yourself as it relates to this dimension and this life. This field is filled with highways and byways that allow spirit to access you and get you information. This field is filled with past life information and can give us information about your physical health, your spiritual well-being, your mental state. Everything about you is contained within your grid. And your grid is trans-dimensional. That means it transcends dimensions. Consider your grid to be your personal dimension. You have specific highways and byways that allow interdimensionals to get messages to you or to make themselves manifest before you. It's not because of the 3D earth dimension. It's because of your grid dimension. I also want to say that it is common for people who see craft, especially repeatedly, but even just once, to have had experiences with the beings on that craft or with interdimensionals unbeknownst to them. A huge portion of our population actually accesses interdimensional energy and has interdimensional or alien experiences typically while they sleep, and they don't remember because these interdimensionals have the facility or the ability to manipulate the grid. They use it to come into our consciousness, and they use it to exit the consciousness, and they can manipulate us in terms of our human energy and our astral body so that we have an experience, but we don't remember it. So I wouldn't be surprised if you've actually had interdimensional contact or 
experiences with aliens. This might be something that you don't remember. And here's a fun fact. People who have had UFO experiences, people who have had experiences with aliens, tend to be in families or genealogies where their parents, their grandparents, their children, their children's children have similar experiences. Some of the interdimensionals visiting our planet at this time are interested in specific bloodlines. They are very interested in how generation after generation after generation develops physically and mentally. And I believe it's because they have a stake in that bloodline somehow. Now, the second question you asked, I'm going to answer because I think it might be connected to the first question. You say, just recently, I read a heart-moving story that made me burst into tears. And when I opened my eyes, I saw three golden orbs above me. When I blinked, they were gone. What were they? Why couldn't and why can't I see them again? Well, I wouldn't be surprised, Pinky if these were interdimensionals, if these were higher level light beings. You should also know that more and more people around the planet are reporting these types of orbs. They often float into a room and some of these orbs are really big. We're talking basketball sized orbs and these orbs often have communications with the person. There are other times when the orb transforms and takes on an anthropomorphic type figure, meaning something that looks like a humanoid, so an angel, or an interdimensional, or a guide. The fact that these orbs entered your room is a type of invitation. I'd like you to speak to that invitation. What I mean by that is, I want you to articulate your desire to understand more, and your desire to know more, and your desire to have high vibration interactions with the beings that entered your room. Say that out loud. That has a force to it. That has an energy to it, and that's a transmission. Hopefully, they'll return. One last word to you, Pinky. Keep a dream journal. Many times our guides and our angels and all of our emissaries teach us and sit with us and work with us while we are sleeping, while we are in the astral. If you wake up and document everything that you remember, even if it doesn't make sense, this opens up the channel to remember more the next time you dream. And hopefully, you'll get a clearer understanding of exactly why it is they're seeking this interaction with you. This next letter comes from Pam W. And she says, Hello, I broke my leg, had surgery with screws and a plate. Could I please get some healing light? Thank you, Pam W. Well, Pam, absolutely. And that's why I inserted it at this point in the podcast, because I think it's something that everybody listening, including myself, can join together to do. We are far more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. And when we activate our energy and then direct that energy, we can modify that which we direct it to. And in this case, I would like us all to visualize Pam W and then send healing energy to her. I like to add the color green to the energy because that's the color of the fourth chakra, which is the heart chakra, which is commonly associated with Archangel Raphael, whose name means God heals. So let's tap into that energy of the heart. Let's add that emerald green color to it, and let's all direct it to Pam W. You can do this on your own time, maybe after the podcast, or you can pause the podcast and do it now, but do it at some point because we all need to help each other, don't we? Pam, I just want you to know that I'm sending you nothing but love and light, and I'm praying for your speedy recovery. And now it's time for the last question of the podcast. This question comes from Debbie L., who lives in Roswell, Georgia. She says, My question is as to the source of the intense anger that began to arise during the overwhelming care of my mother last fall to this spring. I thought the anger would pass when she died and that it was just exhaustion, but it continues to show itself. I've done a great deal of work around it as a healer through prayer and with recovery type stuff. I think it's always been there at a low level, but there is a deep intensity when it comes up and I have a really hard time quelling it. I can never restrain my desire to lash out verbally or in writing. I do not want to be this angry person. 
I do not think this is my true nature. My sense is that I can't clear it because I'm not understanding the original source of it. Any assistance would be deeply appreciated. Okay, Debbie, thank you for this question. I relate a great deal to it. I have a video up on YouTube uh, called, I think it's My Victimization of Others, My Rage. Uh, and I, in it, I explain that I have dealt in my life with rage. And, and I, don't, I don't just mean it like I, I get angry and I get mad at the service person and I walk out. No, I have dealt with rage. And this is a direct result in my life of my childhood and, of course, my father who modeled that for me. He was a rageful individual and he acted on that rage and taught me to do so. In my early 20s, I was a whirlwind. I often call myself a dragon, and I had this long tail that I just whipped around and around, destroying things. And I didn't mind doing it. In fact, I always felt that whoever I hurt, whoever I corrected, whoever I criticized deserved it, because somehow I was placed in the position to mete out the punishment. Well, of course, that was crap. At some point, I began to realize that, like you, this wasn't my nature, and this wasn't the reason that I had come to the planet. I'd come here to do something far more important than just make people feel bad or piss them off. Thus began my 25-year-long work, and I am still doing that work. Debbie, the work never ends. We are always being called to die to the flesh, to die to that animal nature, and to occupy instead the light body, or to occupy instead the love, which I understand that you know. And I realize, you know, you're a healer, you pray. I get that you have the head knowledge and the heart knowledge that this is what you need to do, but you just can't help it. I'd like to reread this line, which says, I can never restrain my desire to lash out verbally or in writing. Do you realize, Debbie, that by saying that, and by articulating it that way, that that becomes the truth? How often do you actually say that? You probably say it a lot. After each time you get mad at someone, or lash out, or become angry, you probably tell yourself after the fact that you just couldn't help it. Well, Debbie, you should know that's a lie that you're telling yourself, and you've been telling yourself that lie for a very long time. You can, in fact, control it, and you must. You must put in place certain coping measures and certain behaviors that you employ or activate as soon as you can sense that this is beginning. You need to condition the mind. You owe it not just to other people, but you owe it to yourself, so you can fully occupy your light body, or your spirit body, because again, that's what you came here to do. A lot of this, Debbie, feels residual, which means it's stuff that's embedded deep within you, within patterns, and these patterns puppet you. These patterns emerge when you're triggered, when you react, when you have that flash rage, which all of a sudden you just can't control yourself, and then it goes away. All of that is just a puppet reaction, and your pattern is the one that's dictating what you're doing. So, of course, you need to get into those patterns, and you need to continue to do the work. I was so disappointed in myself, Debbie, in my 30s, in my early 40s. Well, not really my early 40s, but like my entire 30s and part of my 20s, because I couldn't get it right. I couldn't always avoid my tongue. I couldn't always avoid my anger. But as I committed to the practice of it, and as I employed disciplines, the behavior did slowly but surely start to change. But we're talking years here. But now, if you were to meet me, I am probably the least confrontational person <laughs> that you're going to meet. Well, I don't know if my husband would say that, but I don't like to fight. I don't like the energy of that. It is counterintuitive and it does damage to me directly. And so if I sense the energy of that because I'm feeling the person or I'm feeling the room, I get out of there. I do that for myself. I realize it protects the person, but I do that for myself. I have a mission statement for myself, Debbie, in which I say, I will not intentionally harm anyone. I will not unintentionally harm anyone. Do no harm. Does that mean I always get it right? Absolutely not. But for the most part, 
I do get it right because I've trained myself to do that. So you have continued work here and that's okay. That's why you came here to do exactly this kind of work because for each lesson, there's energy and that energy is assimilated back into who it is that you are and it helps. It all helps even though it often hurts. But I want to tell you something, Debbie, that I see in your field and in your grid. And I don't see this a lot and I don't want this to unsettle you in any way. But I see a hereditary energetic pattern here. You know how we're born with specific traits from our parents, maybe our eyes or our sense of humor, but it's a direct relationship to our parents. Did you know that so too can we inherit their energetic structures and problems and proclivities and patterns? Did you know that you could have within you embedded patterning that doesn't even belong to you? It might not even belong to your parents. It could belong to their parents. It could belong to their parents' parents and so on and so forth. We could call this something like a generational curse, but that's hysterical and I don't like to use the word curse because that's not what it is, but it has been handed down to you from somewhere in your lineage. And I believe it would be helpful for you, if you can, to try and identify where that came from. Try and identify the member within the genealogy that possessed patterning similar to yours. Because there's an energetic reconciliation that needs to take place between you and that person where you absolve yourself of the need to carry this energy and you can lay it down and release it. Now, the possibility remains that you might not know who this is in your family, and that's okay. There are people who can work with these types of energetic anomalies. I'd like to recommend to you a very good friend of mine named Justine Uselding, U-S-E-L-D-I-N-G. She can be found at askdrding.com, A-S-K-D-R-D-I-N-G dot com. Justine is a PhD in psychology, so she's got that entire aspect of it, right? She knows how to talk to people and get into patterns and really go through that analytical process. But she is also an incredible intuitive, and she does shamanic journeying and shamanic type work, work where she will travel into the stuff and help you to unravel it. Please know that I never recommend resources or people to anybody unless I vet them myself or I am 100% confident that that's the right thing to do. And I couldn't be more confident in Justine. I refer all my clients to her if they want a psychic or intuitive reading or if they need journeying done, etc. She's the first person I always think of. And in fact, she's the intuitive that I go to when I need some answers and some insight. So check out Justine as a potential resource source, but keep in mind what it is that I told you. Here's why. What if you could look at this differently, Debbie? And what if instead of blaming yourself and thinking that you're just so mixed up that you absolutely can't control yourself, what if you shifted that blame and realized that it doesn't even have anything to do with you? That you exist as a spiritual being separate and apart from the patterns that are presently puppeting you. And that there's hope that you can cut the ties. We call these Aka cords in Hawaii. Between yourself and between the ancestor who bequeathed this to you. How much hope does that give you? I think you really need to lean into this because I think there's something to it. In conclusion, I just want you to know that I wish you all the love. I totally get you, Debbie. I totally get you and I understand you. In my life, I have hurt a lot of people. In my life, I have done some despicable things and I talk about it and I admit it. I'm not walking the earth pretending like I'm perfect because honey, I am the last person to call myself perfect, but I've lived a life, Debbie, and so have you, and I've endured a lot and so have you. And I'm still acquiring the tools to this day to sift through that life that I've lived, to put it into proper perspective and context so that I can then put that into a form and be of service to somebody. And now I actually have the ability to be thankful for the things that I've endured and to love the crystal that existed at 22 years of age, whipping her dragon tail and hurting people. I can actually love her because she's a part of my evolution. And the Debbie that you were yesterday is a part of yours. 
Well, boom, there it is. There it was. Those were some of your questions and those were my answers. I have more questions that I'm going to get to next week. And again, I encourage you to send your questions in to TuesdayQuestions at CrystalAnnCompton.com. Just follow the instructions as they appear on my instruction page, which is CrystalAnnCompton.com slash podcast so that we can ensure that your letter gets to me and I can potentially answer it in one of these podcasts. I'm sending each and every one of you mass love, mass blessings, so much gratitude. I hope you have a lovely week. I hope you use your gifts and your talents to be of service in this world, not just to yourself, but to others. Let's come together. Let's enjoy this family that we're creating. And I'll see you next week. Until then, I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. Thank you for listening to the Lightworkers Lab podcast. To learn more about Crystal Ann Compton, visit her website at www.crystalanncompton.com or you can visit www.thelightworkerslab.com. 